Welcome uh, to our to our second session of our uh, Case Western Reserve University Sports Entrepreneurship Conference. For those who are just joining for this session, my name is Michael Goldberg, and I'm our Executive Director of the Veal Institute for Entrepreneurship here at Case Western Reserve University. And it's great to welcome back to Cleveland and to campus um, Mark Shapiro. Um, I met Mark when I first moved back here. We're both, actually the, the previous speaker, Mark was also a Princeton alum, Jen Rottenberg, was talking about fan-controlled football. So uh, Mark was a couple years ahead of me at Princeton and we met when I moved back here. And Mark is no stranger to campus. I know we've got some of the coaches from the Case baseball team. Um, who know Mark. Mark's been a speaker in Gary Pillar's class over the years. So um, during Mark's time in Cleveland, he was he did quite a bit in the community um, and here on our campus at Case Western Reserve University. Um, and one of the things that Mark has always been a great at as, as a mentor um, and willing to talk to young people that want to get into baseball. So all of our sessions today are student moderated, except for this one is an alum. Um, so we have Sam Nally, um, who is a recent grad, was a baseball player uh, at the university and uh, spent the last year working for the Detroit Tigers. So um, Sam will moderate on Zoom with Mark. We've got a group of Case students here and also of Hawkins students, which uh, is the high school and, and middle school where, where Mark's kids attended while he lived in Cleveland. So we got a nice mix of this is your life, Mark Shapiro of, of Princeton, Case, Cleveland, and Hawkins right here. Um, so with that, I will turn it over to Sam, who will moderate. And like all of our sessions, we want it to be very active with uh, engagement and questions. So let people know either on Zoom or if you're watching on LinkedIn, um, put it in the comment. If you're on Zoom, just raise your Zoom hand or put a question in, into, the, uh, into the chat. And if you're here, obviously, with me at Case Western Reserve University, just let me know and we'll make sure we get your questions in. So with that, thanks, Mark, and I'll turn it over to Sam. Thank you, Michael. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, Mark, on Zoom. Good morning. Um, like Michael said, we want it to be as interactive with the audience as possible, with as many questions from you, and as much of Mark as possible speaking and sharing. Um, so I'll start it off with just a few broad questions, get things going, and then let, let you guys dive into some of the more specific things that you might have on your mind. Um, so I guess just to start off, Mark, what, what makes an authentic leader? That, that peers and employees can follow, those that draw motivation from and, and want to rally behind for, for an extended period of time. Morning, Sam. Good to, good to see you and talk to you again. Um, you know, I guess hearing that question, you know, it's something I reflect about all the time. My first reaction is uh, I'm not an ultimate source for that question. So this would just be my opinion and kind of my observations over uh, you know, 25 years of leading departments and organizations and kind of observing my whole life and thinking about leadership, you know, quite a bit. Um, and I, I do think that there are some universal attributes, characteristics and traits that leaders have. Um, however, the, the words and the semantics used to kind of discuss it vary from person to person. And um, I think there are probably people that prioritize different things. Um, sustainable, authentic leadership. You know, I've never seen someone that's done those things effectively in one place without having some level of extreme self-awareness, inner peace, um, you know, done the hard work to kind of evaluate what their values are and that they can articulate those values as being a compass. And I say a compass when you're making tough decisions you know, personally and professionally uh, that uh, allow you to pick, you know, where you work, who you work with, you know, tough decisions within uh, your job place. But, you know, the, the leaders that have been most effective for me uh, have a sense of peace about them, you know, in general. And I think that peace comes from them having done the work to understand their values. And so, you know, when I, when I think about you know, try to remember back to being, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Um, and I think about the good decisions I've made uh, as well as the poor ones. Um, the best ones have been to align with people who shared my values. The best ones have been to align with people who shared my values. In order to do that, you have to be aware of what your values are. So one way to think about that for, for someone, you know, beginning that journey is just, asking yourself the questions, you know, when I'm happy, fulfilled, at peace and content, who am I with and what am I doing? 
you know, that's pretty simple, right? Happy, fulfilled, at peace, content. Who am I with? You know, who are the people you're surrounding yourself with? Uh, and what am I doing? And, and those can help you lead to the journey of kind of self-awareness and, and understanding your, your values and your compass. Absolutely. No, that makes a lot of sense. And I think in, in um, specifically today's sports world in general, we're seeing the, the power and value of communication start to, to ease its way into the forefront. Can you speak to what value that has and how much more effective your leadership can be because of the way that you communicate with, with your staff? Yeah, I mean, I think you know, it starts with, you know, it starts with you're, you're kind of leading me through, you know, my model of leadership, which it starts with awareness first of self and then awareness of others, which is kind of empathy and compassion, you know, at a very deep level, understanding the people you're leading, what their goals, aspirations, dreams are, what their insecurities are, you know, entering into that covenant to help them lead. Communication is deploying, you know, that awareness of self and awareness of others to, to help you effectively lead. So, um, you know, the third piece for me is prioritization, but, you know, awareness of self and others, communication, um, which is kind of one that people talk about frequently. I think when you think about communication, you know, one thing to think about is, is you know, while we all you know, make the mistake sometime of watching other great communicators, you know, trying to emulate someone else's communication style probably leads to an inauthentic, you know, communication. So you've got to determine and understand what your unique and, and uh, original authentic communication style is um, and, and stick to that, you know, when you communicate. But what's probably most important is the content you're communicating. And that gets back to your first question is, you know, what, what about your awareness? You know, what about, you know, what defines you and what are your, you know, kind of guiding attributes and traits? What are the things most important to you? So I do think communication is essential, particularly when leading complex organizations like sports organizations, we've got, you know, not just a business and a baseball side within baseball, we've got groups of people who identify talent, groups of people who um, focus on acquiring talent, groups of people who focus on developing talent, and then groups of people who, who you know, focus on building from that talent a major league team. So there's four different functions. Those people are spread out throughout, you know, not just North America, but continents and the world, you know, to do those jobs and something has to bring those people together. So, you know, communication, leadership, um, certainly an aligned vision and set of values are, are what brings those people together. Great. Yep. And I, that's a great uh, lead into um, like to encourage everybody when you're asking questions, Mark's got a great deal of perspective on leading baseball and business operations, but he's also got a hand with some of the other presidents and owners within baseball about uh, decisions that go on at the league level. So please feel free to ask Mark questions um, pertaining to any of those, those, uh, those worlds, if you will. Um, and that leads into defining success and organizing your different departments around success and what that means. Like you said, you've got different uh, departments with, I'm, I'm assuming they have some overlapping uh, definitions of success, but right, you've got business operations that focused on maximizing profit. Baseball, you want to win a World Series, right? Your ballpark operations might be focused on uh, safety and a fan experience, right? How do you um, not push away any of those those different success metrics in exchange yeah. for another? Well, I, you know, I'm going to answer it in kind of a different way. I mean, I think, you know, we have one mission. You know, it's aligned, it's defined, it's absolutely clear, and that's to bring a world championship back to Canada, period. Um, you know, we, we talk about it, you know, our, our, our mission is to get better every day. Uh, in order to bring world champions. So it's kind of that perpetual learning growth, you know, drive for improvement, incremental improvement every single day. And that's universal. That that can be for the intern, you know, in a desk kind of putting together an advanced scouting report, um, you know, for the, uh, you know, for, for a strength coach, for a trainer, you know, or someone, you know, a, an usher, a ticket taker, someone selling tickets, anyone, you know, our, our goal is to wake up every day, get better that day in order to bring a world championship back to Canada, you know, because we are the only major league team that represents a country. That is clear. And when it gets down to, you know, what is that? How does, how do we measure that? And how is do we contribute to that across an entire organization? Uh, how do we make that meaningful? 
I think the easiest way to make that meaningful would resonate with like Indian fans in Cleveland, which is, you know, we've got an uphill battle here. The Indians certainly have one because of, you know, the market size and how Major League Baseball distributes revenue and ultimately, you know, what leads to payroll. But, you know, we're in the AL East. You know, we wake up every day with, A, the best run small franchise in the game and the Tampa Bay Rays and B, the two largest markets in all of Major League Baseball next to the Dodgers probably and the Yankees and Red Sox. So, you know, our task is monumental. It's, you know, it's, it's, it's enormous. You know, we've got to overcome foreign exchange rate. We've got to overcome a smaller market and overcome an extremely well-run organization. Um, so what I, what I say is that's not one leader. That's not one player. You know, it's not Vladdy Jr. It's not me. It's not Ross Atkins. It's not Charlie Montoyo. Um, it's not one decision or one system or one process. The only way that we can operate at a level that we fulfill that mission is if, you know, 500, 600 people across the organization wake up and think about the incremental opportunity for, for us to, to drive towards that world championship. And people have to understand that the dotted line, if they are a custodial worker that, you know, is you know, responsible for cleaning the stadium, that that's impacting our fans experience, our fans impact our revenue and, um, and, and our ability to, to drive a payroll that moves a little bit closer towards those large market teams to get resources. If, you know, someone is a trainer rehabbing a player in Dunedin, Florida, um, with no one around that's 18 years old in the middle of the summer with, you know, 90 degree weather and hundred percent humidity that that player could contribute to a world championship four years from now, even though no one's watching during that rehab process. So it's gotta be greater than just checking the box of doing a good job. You know, every single woman and man in the organization has to feel like, they are personally accountable and responsible for driving championship success. They need to take ownership of that. Um, and like I said, work to get better every day, work to perpetually improve. If we're doing that across 600 people, um, every scout, you know, every you know, analyst, every coach, every nutritionist, every you know, sleep expert, every you know, communications person, you know, than every accountant, but every person in the organization wakes up feeling a sense of responsibility um, and holds themselves to doing exceptional work. Then we have a scalable competitive advantage, right? You know, and that's where we do overcome, you know, enormous odds uh, objectively uh, and build a sustainable championship organization. So um, that's how I think about tying everyone to it. Um, that's how I think about making people realize that regardless of the work they're doing, they all either dot line or direct line to the contributions on field. It's easy to feel distance from the 26 players on the major league team. Uh, the day that happens, we're going to do less than, than exceptional work. And for us to be, you know, a championship organization, we need to be exceptional and everything, every single person, there can't be a weak link. Michael, we got a we do from we a do. Student, right? So if you can stand up, turn around, and say hi to Mark and Sam, and introduce yourself. Hi, uh, my name is Zach Velli. I'm a sophomore. I'm on the men's uh, soccer team at Case. Uh, my question is a little more general about your career path. Uh, is this something you always dreamed and envisioned yourself doing, or did that change over the years? And can you talk a bit about like climbing the ladder within organizations and how you got to where you are? Is that, yeah, I mean, that's a good question. I'll try to answer that as succinctly and briefly as I can. When you're, when you're as old as me, it's hard to answer that <laughs> succinctly and briefly. But uh, I, you know, I guess I would say I, I've always had a passion for baseball. It's been a part of the fabric of growing up. It's part of the bond with my dad. It's part of the bond I have with my son um, as well. So baseball has always been in my blood. Um, I did not know what I wanted to do. I went to a liberal arts college. Um, and as Michael said at Princeton, I was a history major. I didn't have kind of a preordained, you know, drive to be a lawyer or a doctor or a professional. I, I didn't really know what I wanted to do. Um, I knew I loved sport. I knew I loved, you know, I knew I aspired to lead. Um, and I knew, I think instinctually that I wanted to work in an organization where I was part of something special and believed in the people that I work with. And, you know, I, I went and worked for two years in real estate development in Southern California, which, which I learned a lot 
you know, and, and then I worked as an analyst in New York City for six months, too. And what I learned from those first two jobs are, you know, some leaders that I didn't want to work for and some some jobs I didn't want to do. What I learned most importantly was kind of what was important to me and what would have made me happy and fulfilled. That led me to pursue a career in sports um, and ultimately led me to work for the Cleveland Indians and when they were the worst organization in all of Major League Baseball and lost 104 games. Um, but I was happy doing it from the day I got there in 19, in the winter of 91, 92, because of the people I was working for and kind of the, the plan, the vision that they had put in place and the level they empowered me to contribute. Um, and from there, it's always just been kind of as simply as I can put it, Zach, I just kind of focused on every single job given to me. I'm going to do better and faster than my boss expected. Uh, I didn't have a driving goal that I needed to reach some level uh, that I needed to rise or be promoted on any kind of time frame. It was just kind of living words that my dad said to me when I was in high school, that the, the better I did, the better options and alternatives I've had for college and university. And the better I did in university, you know, the better options I'd have in a career and a job and the better I performed in my job, the better options I'd have as I went through that. And as, the further I went, the more, I understood the things that made me happy that I wanted to do, and that was to lead people um, to help them be the best they can be to ensure that they, you know, grew and developed to have a legacy of people leading around the game uh, that I helped contribute to their to their goals and uh, to accomplish, you know, extremely challenging things together, you uh, know, and maybe overcome some some odds that people other people feel are insurmountable uh, by a group by having a group of people join together and, and do exceptional things. So, um, no, it wasn't like a, I, I didn't have like a goal. I want I definitively want to be a major league baseball general manager. Um, it wasn't like within me from the time I was 16. I do talk to kids that have those goals very clearly at a very young age. I was not that guy. Um, but I have always kind of wanted to let lead. And, uh, I think that, and, and always had a passion and love for sport and like competing, uh, you know, competing has been a very <laughs> consistent part of my life um, and have a special bond with the game of baseball. So we have another question here, Mark. It's from your friend, Matt. Uh, Mark, so we've got a, a lot of youngsters here, uh, college kids, high school kids, who I'm sure are interested in working in Major League Baseball. We have guys like Sam, we have, we have you know, Bianca, people who have, they like to climb, they, they climb the ladder. And Major League teams right now are giving low-level opportunities to recent graduates from coding to mathematics, anywhere in between. What would you say to, to young kids who maybe get that opportunity on how to set themselves apart from the others uh, once they do get their foot in the door? That's a good question, Matt. First of all, you guys are lucky to have Matt in your community. He's a, a leader that I've learned a lot from over you know a long period of time, embarrassingly long period of time for both of us, and uh, a guy that I'm a big fan of, and as I am a of his program. So um, I guess, Matt, what I'd say is like the, the singular advice I would give to people embarking on a career at the start of it um, and or looking to get in uh, would be to to have a strategy and a plan of how to differentiate yourself, you know, to assume and consider um, that everybody you're competing with for those opportunities is smart, hardworking, and passionate. So when you're selling yourself, those aren't things to sell. Those are just kind of baselines. If you're, you're smart, you're going to a very good, you know, academic school, you have a good track record of, of succeeding academically. Um, you clearly work hard and, but everybody has to work hard, you know, to be successful in anything in life, particularly in highly competitive environments like this one. Uh, and you've got a passion for baseball, but, but every single person that, whose resume crosses my desk has that passion too. So I think what helps differentiate people, what leads to Derek Falvey going from an intern to, you know, an entry level, you know, cubicle dweller with the Indians to the president of baseball operations with the Minnesota twins, uh, Mike Chernoff, same path, Chris Antonetti, same path names you guys are probably familiar with if you're Indians fans is those people did certain things to differentiate themselves. Those people did certain things to add value uh, beyond just being smart, hardworking, and passionate. Whether that means they went out and did a 
you know, created a body of research, whether that means they went out and got practical experience with some of the more innovative places like driveline or the Texas baseball ranch, or kind of learn some things that they could then bring back to a major league organization that that organization didn't have in skill set or experience. Um, whether it means they've gone out and kind of gained a, a, an expertise in, uh, in coding and video that kind of supplement a major league baseball's organization. But what I would say is kind of study the people that are in front offices that are contributing to decisions that are being made. Look at their, not just their educations, their skill sets and their, their past work experience, but look at kind of their profile, their characteristics and attributes and how they contribute to decisions. And like anything successful in life, develop a plan and strategy to, you know, to get one of those jobs. And uh, once you get one of those jobs to continue to contribute and the day you get there, you know, think about, you know, how you can make that organization better. Any organization worth working for is not going to be hierarchical in nature and is not going to kind of make you pay your dues. They're going to be looking for you to make them better the day they get there. That was, that's been the same for me, whether I was with the Indians or the Blue Jays, we're looking for young people to come in and make us better, not young people to come in and pick up lunch and do data entry, um, you know, and do menial tasks. We want young people to come in and make us better the day they get here. Um, genuinely, I can give you 20 stories about how that's happened, you know, both with the Indians and the Blue Jays. Um, so, so you need to prepare yourself to join an organization and make it better, not just kind of learn and do work. Great. Sam and Mark, we have another student question. If you want to turn around. Yeah. Hi, Mr. Shapiro. Uh, my name is Devin. I'm a senior at Hawken. Uh, I was wondering, since you guys have some of these very exciting, uh, younger, marketable guys like uh, Vladdy, Bobichet, and Biggio. I was wondering what specifically you guys have done uh, within the Blue Jays organization to help like grow your fan base, uh, you know, in a new digital era. Hey, Dan. Good question. Um, you know, we we are excited about our young core of players, and you know, Vladdy and Bo, and you know, so many of the young guys, Alec Manoa. You know, are special young talents in the game. Uh, we've got one of the biggest um, digital you know, followings in all of Major League Baseball. That's probably, you know, due to the fact that our territory is the biggest. You know, we're the only territory that's 36 million people, not, you know, six, seven or eight million because we represent an entire country. So um, if you follow us on Instagram, if you follow us, you know, on, you know, look at our Snapchat stories, you know, look at our TikToks, you know, you'll you'll see that we are out there trying to create a strong connection between our players uh, and an authentic connection between our players and our fans to help them get to know we've got, you know, it, it would be, it would have been inconceivable for me to think 15 years ago that we'd have, you know, a digital media content person uh, and ultimately two or three that kind of travel with our major league team and are part of our major league entourage. And they're just there to provide unique uh, insight and and uh, a window into our major league environment that no fan could possibly have. So the answer to my question would be, you know, look at some of the really cool, you know, IG stories that are out there. Look at the ones on the home run jacket, uh, on the path and journey of Teoscar Hernandez and some of our other players. I think they'll give you kind of that unique insight. Um, we also encourage our players to kind of develop um, their following and to interact authentically, but that, that varies from guy to guy. Um, so whether we're thinking about developing those players as teammates and leaders at a very young age, we're also thinking about developing them as, you know, part of our brand because they actually authentically uh, reflect the values that we want Blue Jay players to be. They're smart, they're tough, and they're great teammates. Great. Is there anybody on Zoom that has a question for Mark? If not, I can throw one in and keep us going. All right. Um, back to some more general stuff about leadership. Great leaders deal with adversity very well. And I think we'd be, <clears throat> excuse me, very reminisce not to discuss the challenges the Blue Jays faced during COVID. You were the only organization that literally could not go home for 18 months about, right? What, what was it like from an organizational level to have to deal with that adversity, having to be in Buffalo and Dunedin for a very extended period of time? Yeah. 670 days, man. 
670 days. That's the amount of time we went between playing home games, you know, and when I reflect on that, you know, I didn't allow myself or anyone else in our organization to reflect on the meaning of that as we were going through it. Um, but I reflect on it now, it, it's almost inconceivable that we're still in a pennant race today and kind of, you know, fighting for a playoff spot and have had a successful season. Um, hard to describe the challenge of being the visiting team for 670 days. Hard to describe what it, what it feels like to play in what's supposed to be a home stadium, but be, you know, ridiculed and cheered, you know, have the other team cheered for in every single game, which happened to us in both Dunedin and Buffalo. Um, you know, we played in full Paul Barks in Buffalo that were, it was full of Yankee fans. Uh, we played in, you know, Dunedin where the fans cheered for the Rays, the Braves, the Yankees, the Phillies, anybody but us, you know, that we played. So Mike Trout came in, they cheered for Otani and Mike Trout, not us, you know, so, um, and they were minor league ballparks too. They weren't major league ballparks. What I walk away from in thinking about that, Sam, is an unbelievable amount of pride because I never heard one complaint. I never heard one excuse. And those excuses and complaints were right there on a silver platter, you know, for, for our group to be able to kind of take it as an excuse. We had every excuse why we shouldn't be successful this year, why we should have said, Hey, we'll just wait till next year. Like that's completely acceptable. And instead it was very much of an attitude on the business side that, we are, we are committed to making Dunedin our major leagues. We are committed to creating a major league environment in Buffalo. And they transformed those facilities into incredible facilities that were the best they could possibly be for a low A ball facility and, uh, and, a, and an older AAA facility. And, and then we you know, turned to our coaches and our staff and our players who absolutely said, it is what it is, you know, no excuses. Like we've got to, you know, not what it should be. And we've got to figure out how to get better and be a championship organization in this environment. So uh, I think in the end, it's going to be a big part of our story. It's a big part of who we are and our identity. Uh, I'm a big believer that adversity and challenges and setbacks, um, you know, define, you know, our success moving forward. The scars on our back become the foundation that we build upon. Um, and everybody has dealt with challenges over the past, you know, two years but no one has dealt with them at an organizational level in MLB like we have. So uh, it's something that, you know, I'm incredibly proud of the way that our, both our baseball and our business organization handled that. Um, and, and happy that that the toughest part of that is behind us, but we'll never forget, you know, uh, the pride that I feel, you know, in our people for, for how they handled it. Absolutely. No, it's, it was an outstanding overcome of a challenge. We've got a couple of questions on zoom. Jacob Grice, if you want to unmute yourself, go ahead. Uh, question for Mark. Yeah, uh, just relating to what you were saying at the beginning about knowing your values and shaping your organization around that. And I think you see this most often in football with a lot of Belichick assistants who go somewhere else and try to maybe copy him too much. But I guess when you ascended to the top job or with Chernoff and Antonetti after you who have done such a great job in the transition, how do you differentiate yourself from who came before, but also staying true to maybe what was successful in the past? Yeah, Jacob, it's a great question. And you're right. I have seen plenty of people, um, including people close to me kind of that have been, that have worked for very high profile uh, successful leaders. And, and, you know, I would say this to you, it's one mistake I made when I first got the opportunity to be a GM with the Indians. Uh, some of the first decisions I made, not necessarily leadership style, but decisions I made were decisions that I made the same way John Hart would have made them. And I wasn't John Hart. I wasn't going to be successful leading or uh, framing, helping an organization, you know, get to good results and good decisions in the same way that he did. So, um, I think it gets back to the very first question Sam asked, like you better and, and need to have an authentic understanding of who you are, what your values are, what your strengths are, as well as what your limitations are. Um, and that constant fight for both self-awareness and for and to ensure that your insecurities don't derail, you know, your efforts and your leadership and your your drive to success. Um, are a continual thing. They're not like a day to day. So, you know, I think if you're, if you are um, 
a sustainable, successful leader, then you're constantly learning. You're not ever done. You're constantly depending upon the people around you. Um, but you have some definable, some clearly defined, you know, values that, you know, guide both your communication style and your leadership style that are unique to you. Um, it takes an effort to get there. Like I, I'm a byproduct of the great people and institutions that impacted me. My dad, um, grandparents, um, my high school in Baltimore, Maryland, Gilman, Princeton, you know, the Indians, uh, great leaders, you know, that I've been around that have impacted me, coaches as well. But there's also something that's inherently and independently just me. Um, and it took a long time to kind of figure out that I can be proud of those big time leaders and, and institutions that impacted me. But I also need to be, I have to do the hard work to determine what, you know, independently drives me, what fulfills me and what is at the core of my values and my leadership. And those things for me are, are inextricable, right? Like the leader I am is the man I am. I don't walk into a building and say, I'm CEO of the Blue Jays uh, and, and change into something that I'm not as a father, as a friend, as a partner, as a brother, as a son, you know, those things all have to be the same. So the more work you do to be authentic as a human being, the more effective and authentic you can be as a leader. So be positively impacted and, and embrace the impact those people have had on you, but work to understand independently who you are as a human being as well. Is that, is that helpful, Jacob? Yeah, definitely. And I, uh, I didn't know you went to Gilman, so I'm surprised you matriculated to baseball rather than lacrosse. <laughs> <laughs> Believe me, we had, we would have 50 people at our baseball games and there would be 2000 in the lacrosse games just across the field. So <laughs> no, thank you though. Yeah. Mark, we've got another question on zoom. Uh, from Jaden Boyle. Jaden, if you want to unmute yourself. Thanks very much. Uh, how have you felt analytics have evolved over the last decade in the, in the industry? And then what do you see as some of the major challenges in the coming decades that the, the group will have to face? Jaden, I mean, you know, I've seen the full evolution of analytics from, uh, you know, us making decisions with paper scouting reports and stat books on our laps and filing cabinets to, you know, organizations, the best organizations having, you know, analytics uh, staffs of 15 to 20 to, to 30 people and some of the biggest ones. So um, I guess, you know, early on, there was an opportunity just to have analytics to contribute to more data driven, informed decision making, you know, now to me, the ultimate, competitive advantage advantage from analytics comes more from culture. And, um, you know, that may sound soft and touchy feely, but I guess what I would say is this, it's less about, you know, having good information and more about having an humble, a, a humble and open-minded organization that will apply that information to every single decision you make. So if you think about the scale of decision-making that we have to make, um, from, you know, the draft to when we move players from level to level to how we develop players to how we build a major league team to how we utilize information in game, bullpen usage, lineup construction, day to day, you know, decision making. There are so many incremental opportunities to gain competitive advantage where analysis and data and technology, all three converge to help us make better decisions how open-minded, um, how secure people are, how collaborative people are, um, is more of a challenge than it sounds. You know, it's a challenge for, you know, a person who spent 30 years of their life in uniform and never left the field to be open-minded to an intern, you know, bringing an idea that could hap happen to help in how we utilize the bullpen and, and take advantage of leverage situations. Um, that may sound counter to everything that they've experienced or thought the way they've thought about bullpen usage, um, but, you know, the most collaborative, the most open-minded or organizations are going to be able to utilize the information generated by really smart people in analytics the, the opportunities are smaller and smaller, though, to beat people through analytics. I think the opportunities are bigger and bigger to beat people through culture. So, um, you know, you've got to have really good people uh, 
gathering the information, managing the information, doing the analysis, and then you've got to have a special culture that's open-minded enough to use the information to decisions that scale across an entire organization. Fantastic, thank you very much. Thank you. We've got a question from somebody tuning in on LinkedIn. With player marketability becoming increasingly important to engaging fans, how does that factor in your player acquisition decisions? It, uh, I mean, I, I, I would probably say it doesn't when you make effective decisions. I, I, I tend to believe that the most marketable players are the ones that are there when you win. Um, certainly, each of them have independent attributes and some desire to be more marketable than others. You know, Marcus Semyon is marketable because he's an unbelievable professional, goes about his business in a way that no other player I've ever seen goes about his business with a level of toughness professionalism and commitment to the game and his teammates that is unparalleled, but he's certainly not, you know, someone that's looking to spend a lot of time cultivating a, a marketable personality. Um, so it's up to us as an organization to kind of identify what's unique and special about each player. Uh, and as the earlier question, you know, came and, and to help fans understand and see that some players are going to, are going to kind of uh, embrace the opportunity to, to engage more directly, you know, with their fans and other guys, you know, it's up to us to kind of go out there and do it. But I think ultimately, you know, if you win, um, your players become more marketable. It's really, uh, it's really challenging to have a marketable player impact your business in a, in a really positive way. Uh, if you're not, you know, a championship or at least contending type of environment. So, uh, a lot of things are taken care of by that drive to, you know, to build a championship team and ensure that the people you have are good people and the values that you're looking for in those players are, are reflected in the way they play the game. Great. We've got another one through the chat here on Zoom. Uh, it's from Ryan Levine. He's curious if adjusting to a new country and the culture there is different and if that has changed your approach. Hi, Ryan. Good to, good to talk to you again. Um, yeah, I mean, I think moving to a new country, you know, was a challenge to my own open mindedness, I guess. You know, it's been uh, so many things are, are comfortable here because the language is, is largely the same. There's a lot more French, uh, but it is a, a very different place with a very different history. Uh, and that history kind of changes the way people um you know, think and interact and communicate. Uh, there are incredible things here that have opened my mind up to how, you know, how much better things can be done, especially when it comes to race and open-mindedness and compassion and, and progressiveness. And there are some things here that, you know, could be, you know, better modeled after the way things are done, you know, where I grew up in the U.S. So, um, in the end, it's been a positive experience because I think it's caused me to, to, to not, to be a little bit less comfortable, you know, which is a good thing. It's caused me to have a greater appreciation for, you know, continuing to be uh, humble and learning and open. Um, and uh, it's caused me to continue to work to, to get better and prove myself to not rest on anything I've already done. So I've also seen it have a massive impact, uh, particularly on Caden, my son, and, and uh, who was, you know, impacted you know, profoundly by his time here and, and my daughter, Sierra, as well. Great. Mark, we've got one more question live in ThinkBox. Michael. Hey, Mark. My name is Ben. I'm a recent alumni from Case Western Reserve. My question for you is uh, you talked about how the organization has values. However, you have your own personal brand to make decisions. I think um, one problem with young people is that they don't really have the confidence to have that personal brand in their work and in the way they make decisions. And I'm wondering if you ever had an experience where you know you had the confidence to kind of stand up and, and start choosing to make decisions on your own uh, rather than just trying to be like a yes man or trying to please whoever you were working with. Well, it's a good question. Um, I guess, you know, like my, I can think of like a, a, a numerous decisions from both personal and professional decisions. Um, the easiest way to make consistent decisions that, you know, help you build 
uh, and learn, not always make right decisions, by the way, but decisions you can learn from if they're not right, is to have a, a consistent set of, uh, you know, have to have that compass that I talked about and a consistent set of values that contribute towards your decision making and to have your decisions be part of a larger framework of kind of a strategy or a plan. Um, the most, the biggest challenge in kind of uh, helping lead an organization to make decisions or the personal decisions you make are when they're scattershot, when there's nothing behind them, when you're kind of hoping uh, either to satisfy someone else or that, you know, they will or to mirror what someone else has done and copy what someone else has done. But when they're not authentically and genuinely founded or built upon uh, your own set of values or your own vision or plan or strategy, or they're not contributing to our broader strategy and plan, but still driven by your, your beliefs and your values and that covenant and alignment you have with the people you work with, um, A, you're either not working in the right place. Uh, or B, you're not making them for the right reasons. And it also makes it makes it hard to learn from the ones that don't work. So um, I get, you know, I'd circle all the way back to kind of the first conversation, which is do the hard work to identify your own values, align with people that share those values, you know, identify leaders, you know, that create cultures around those values and seek to work in those environments. Um, and have those be a part of your decision making process and your, you know, both your personal brand and your decision making process as well. We've got one more on Zoom. Uh, Joel Gershenfeld, if you want to unmute. So, um, hi, Mark. It's a delight to hear you. Uh, my question is about uh, your dad's work in negotiations and writing on that. And of course, with the upcoming collective bargaining, there will be hard bargaining on hard issues. But there's also the potential for uh, robust problem solving. Uh, collective bargaining needn't be only an adversarial process. And I'm wondering, you know, what are the prospects for um, what some people call bargaining over how to bargain before the negotiations begins? so that it can lift up the mutual interests that are shared? Hi, Joel. Uh, good question. Um, and probably one that there are a lot of people more qualified than me, like as probably you that could answer it. But um, I'm going to be careful knowing that, you know, this is a public forum and, you know, I've got probably certain beliefs that would not be constructive to the environment that we're in now. Um, I guess when I reflect on my dad's lessons about negotiation and kind of the drive for win-win, um, I do think about kind of what's going to be most successful in navigating a, uh, a very challenging uh, terrain in front of us uh, in getting to a new collective bargaining agreement. And that is, if we could ever pull back and align behind both the players and owners understanding that they're both stakeholders in the game, um, that if we could if we could get away from the myopic short term issues that drive either just salaries this moment or revenues this moment and think about collectively taking building a system and structure um, that ultimately, you know, grows the game for everyone involved, both players and owners, um, I think we could, you know, have a better chance um, at uh, creating a structure and a system that benefits everyone in the long run. Um, some alignment also behind, you know, loving the game and caring about the game and being as all being caretakers for the game and, you know, ultimately recognizing that, you know, our time in the sun is limited and that the game is greater than any group, either a player or an owner, and the game will outlast either a player or an owner is also, I think, uh, an important thing to remember. Uh, and then ultimately, like the relationships matter, you know, like in order to have a win-win, you know, that level of re respect, uh, that level of trust has to be built over time. And that's probably, Joel, the biggest challenge that we're facing right now is that over a long period of time, the level of trust um, is not strong enough. And I do have thoughts and ideas, again, probably not constructive for me to share those in this environment, but um, the more we can do to kind of build the trust, uh, the more we can recognize that there is, 
you know, alignment and there is a, a common benefit to kind of getting past thinking about how we divide the pie and thinking about how we grow that pie together uh, and thinking less about how we divide the pie, but more about how great this game is, uh, the better opportunity I think we have to align behind finding the system um, that, you know, we can best compensate players and best allow for a product that our fans um, can uh, can appreciate now and that more fans can appreciate over time. So it is complex. It is challenging. I'm oversimplifying it and how I'm talking about it, but I ultimately do believe like a better understanding of each other, a better alignment behind how great the game is, a better alignment about how to grow the game would probably lead us, you know, to a better system. I might add, if I might add, I appreciate how you're framing it not as a one-time negotiation, but as an ongoing system and architecture really for the relationship to, to continue. Um, because if you think of it as a continuing relationship, then some of the shared interests become more visible and more salient. Yeah, and it's it's the construct for you know a more effective way to kind of build something lasting and long term that allows us to grow rather than every five years think about you know how do we you know create a system that you know better rewards people. So um, if we're if we're do a, if we do a good job growing the game and taking care of the game everybody will be rewarded around it, uh, most importantly, our fans. And I think that they're the core of everything. We can't forget that. Great. Thank you very much, Joel. That is a outstanding question to wrap up on and just come full circle with some of the things you were discussing at the beginning of the session with communication, authenticity, and, and relationship building around a, a, a strong set of values. Um, thank you to everybody, both in ThinkBox and on Zoom today virtually for your great questions and thank you to Mark for spending the last 45 minutes with us sharing some of your experiences and perspective. We really appreciate it. No, great to be with you. I, I appreciate everybody uh, spending the time and I look forward to hoping to have a chance to interact and learn from you guys in the future as well. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Mark and Sam, for doing this great conversation. Go Blue Jays. Uh, best of luck in the rest of the season.